Anybody got any good thing they want to say this morning? How many of you ever been in you ever been to pre K class? Maybe you remember going to kindergarten. How many of you had the good thing you had to say every day? Uh, somebody got a good thing they want to say today? Well, I sure could use to hear it. Between me and you. I'm starting to think. <clears throat> I'm starting to think God's showing mercy on all them old timers, taking them out of here. <laughs> uh, so what does that mean for you? Well, you make your own conclusions, but I got mine. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um. Man, let's uh, let's pray again and. Ask the Lord to <clears throat> bless this morning. As Miss Susan said, and 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 uh, one one of one of the guys that w- probably the very first guy that ever uh, actually impacted me in terms of preaching, uh, in in a in a different way was was Larry Brown uh, from North Augusta, South Carolina. That's the place me and Jordan packed up packed up and moved to and uh we stayed in South Carolina for about four years and um and and God blessed our family because of it <clears throat> we learned how to be a family um we learned that a father that a that a that we were supposed to leave our father and mother and didn't even mean to but we learned it and um and, I, you know, there's a lot of good things. God saved Jordan in South Carolina. And a lot of great things happened over there. And, and, and there's some not so great things that happened over there. Uh, but but I, do, I do praise the Lord for, for Larry Brown's life and what God did through him, what God did through him in me. I was a very young Christian, and uh, God used him in a, in a marvelous way in my own life. So praise the Lord for him and his life. Um, they're going to celebrate his life is coming Wednesday. I, I don't know all the details yet uh, as far as I think it's earlier during the day, but um, but pray for them and, and, uh, and all that. Um, I, also, man, let's be remembering uh, Louisiana right now. Uh, they're, they are fixing to get, unless something drastic happens, they're fixing to get hammered big time. Uh, almost the same kind of storm at the same time of the year coming on land at the very same place 16 years ago happened Katrina and so the devastation the potential devastation is there for them so let, let's pray uh, somebody told me the oil rigs were all evacuated which praise the Lord means you know we all get to pay more for gas probably so I'm looking forward to that. Amen. <laughs> uh, so, so let's just ask the Lord to really uh, work in, in uh, Louisiana and, and God to whatever God does. Whatever God does, he'd be glorified through those people. Um, Brian, won't you pray for us, man?
Amen. Last week we looked at Galatians. The, the highlight of last week's sermon would be verse number 4. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of, the fa- according to the will of God and our Father. And last week as we looked at the message that the Apostle Paul is trying to convey, that would essentially be the theme and set the stage for the entirety of the book of Galatians. The message being proclaimed is that God, through the giving of himself for our sins, has given, has given us the ability. I want you to listen to this. This is, if you can get on board with verse number 4 and not apply verse number 4 in terms of God taking us to heaven, but God giving us the ability to be delivered from this present evil world. In other words, that, that His sacrifice has afforded us the opportunity to presently live in a new world while at the same time escaping the evil of living in this present time that we're in. That God has so separated us that you and I can live in a new world. Being that we're already seated in heavenly places. That you and I can live in a completely different world and escape this world. Escape the evil of this world. Escape the corruption and the affections and the lust of this world. Now, the Galatians had a major problem. And and, and as much as they wanted to walk in this new world, it was really hard. Because there was a group of people that came along known as the Judaizers. And these Judaizers, as they come from the Jerusalem church to the churches at Galatia, they're stressing the need that the Gentiles need to be circumcised and they need to keep the law of Moses both for full acceptance and, 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 and for the basis of all their Christian living, they, they must do these things. They must be circumcised and they must keep the law of Moses to make sure that they're fully accepted by God and, and that they can live this Christian life to the fullest. This is what they have to do. Now, we all know you, any, anything that says you can earn anything from God, what did we say it was? It's evil. Anything or anybody that says you can earn anything from God is evil. And this world system comes into play when you start messing around with evil. And so that's exactly what the Judaizers are doing. They have become evil in the sight of God with the way the world system has now convoluted, has now come into play with the gospel. The book of Romans in your Bible is to teach us that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone and everybody said amen for that. Now here's the major problem. We all, we all like to say amen that salvation is by grace through faith, through faith in Christ alone. But, but here's the deal. This whole idea of sanctification is, a, is an idea that you and I can do something to now earn the favor of God and earn the grace of God that we were extended at salvation. And so the book of Galatians is sitting in your Bible to let you know that the way of sanctification is not how good you are. The way of sanctification is not how great you are, how great of a Christian you are, how, great, how many things you can lay aside. It is literally there to teach us that sanctification is by grace through faith in Christ alone. My salvation is, in, is by grace through Christ alone. My sanctification, it is as well. By grace through faith in Christ alone. So today we'll we'll start in verse number 6 and and, and I purposely, after the book of Romans, decided that I'm going to do my very best to shorten up these reviews. Amen. Everybody said amen. Listen, I I guarantee you I could probably ask half the the congregation what I even preached last week. Nobody could tell me anyway. So 
uh, the review, you know, it is what it is. Verse number six, verse number six. I marvel. Now, now I, I want you to get this at the top of your at the top of your outline. It says Noah the gospel, and I, I I want you to start hearing this with a fresh set of ears. In terms of the apostle Paul, as he is addressing this church at these churches in this region, I, I want you to I want you to hear it the way the apostle Paul is is saying it. He says, "I marvel that ye are so soon removed." From him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we have said before so say I, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that, than that ye have received, let him be accursed. You see, there's a major problem that has now, that has now been exposed. Verse number 6 exposes that there is the infiltration of another gospel. That the churches at Galatia have bit into another gospel. I, I, if there has ever been a strong, harsh, and severe book of the Bible that Paul wrote, this is it, man. This is it. When, when, when you're thinking in terms of how strong and how harsh and how severe and how, how incensed that the Apostle Paul is, there is no other book in the Bible. You say, what do you think that's all about? I think if you read into the tones of the Bible, you can see that the Apostle Paul is very serious about what's taking place in Galatians. He is so disturbed that he says, I marvel. I, I marvel that you're so soon removed. Now, I want you to get this. What is the Apostle Paul actually marveling at? He's, he's, marvel, he's marveled that they are so soon removed. They're so soon removed. Now, I want you to get this. If anyone knew that false teachers was going to come in, it would be Paul. If anyone knew that false teachers would come in after he had done preached in these regions, it was the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter number 20 and verse 28, Take heed, there, uh, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the flock of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, now notice how serious this is. I want you to feed the flock of God which, which God hath purchased with his own, with his very own blood. Now notice verse 29. For I know this. For I know this. I want you to feed them because I know something that you don't know. That after my departing, after I leave, shall grievous wolves come, uh, enter in among you, not sparing the flock. They're not going to feed the flock. They're, they're coming in to kill the flock. They're coming in to destroy the flock. They're coming in to cut the flock's throats and leave them laying. Also of your own selves. Listen. Also of your own selves shall men arise. Out of your own congregation shall men arise. Out of your own place of worship shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after who? After them. After those people. I mean it was almost like Paul saying there is no doubt in my mind that they're going to come. And that's why you got to feed the flock of God. And guess what? That's why the sheep got to eat. A preacher that spends all his time doing his best to study to show himself approved and to feed the flock among him that God gave him in a, in a group of sheep that won't eat. Listen, the judgment seat, they won't be on the pastor then. Look 
what he says in 2 Corinthians verse number 11. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve, Eve through subtility. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that, it, that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in Christ. Are you telling me that, that this thing is simple? Well, I'm telling you what the Bible says. Yeah, it's simple. The simplicity here is that it is in Christ. For if he cometh, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom ye have not, whom, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not, which uh, ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Verse number 13, skip down to verse 13. For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed, uh, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Acts chapter 13. And when they had gone through the isle of Paos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar Jesus. Sounds like a nightclub somewhere, doesn't it? <laughs> Which was with the deputy in the country of Sergius, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, get this, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elmas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and he, he had a real nice talk with him. He set his eyes on him, and he set him down, and he said, Look, man, I, I, I understand you know, that me and you, we're, you know, we're probably, we think a little bit different about things. I, we think different, but man, listen, I think if me and you can come to a mutual understanding that we'll be able to get along, to get along. I, I think we can come to a, 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 a reasoning, if you would. Let's reason together and, and let's see if we can mesh the sorcery that you enjoy and what I, I, I really, I really enjoy Jesus. You know, we, we do spirit fingers and stuff at church. I really enjoy Jesus. And man, I'll tell you what, if we can mesh the two together, man, we can, oh, dude, can you imagine the church we could build? Oh, my goodness. We would build a structure like no other. And we could have thousands come in. And thousands come in, and man, we could just, we could just, long as we made sure that we didn't offend any, anybody, and we kept it, you know, Jesus, and man, I, I think we'll do real good together. It, it, we all know that, what he said. Verse number 10, when Paul set his eyes on him, he said, Oh, full of all subtility and all mischief, Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? He doesn't sound very ecumenical. He sounds one-sided. He sounds like it's his way or the highway. He sounds like he's made a decision, he's drove a stake in the sand, and he said, I will not move. It sounds like he's come to an adequate conclusion that he's willing to die for. Well, that's it's not really the way of 2021. 
that's not really the way that we work. We work by acceptance. We work by making sure that everybody is loved and everybody is accepted. Well, friend, I got news for you. Somebody has got to be wrong. There's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. And the Apostle Paul is calling out false teachers for what they are. There's four characteristics found in verse number 10 of false teachers. Number one, they're extremely deceitful. They're extremely deceitful. Number two, they're children of the devil. Number three, they're enemies of righteousness. Number four, they're perverters of truth. Paul knew that false teachers were going to come in. Paul knew that false teachers were going to come in, but that's not what is so disturbing to Paul. What got Paul is that he could not believe that without even a fight, they were removed from the gospel that they were set in. Without even so much as a fight. I mean, without even so much as, as, as a simple rebuke. He says, I cannot believe. I cannot believe that you're so easily swayed. You're so easily, that you're so soon just removed from the one thing that I just, I, I just knew you were set in. So easily removed. See, it blew Paul away that they would be so easy to accept something like the Judaizers were pushing on them. Now this, 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 isn't just, this isn't just some doctrine, any old doctrine that you pick up in the Bible. We may differ on things of, 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 of the coming of the Lord. I got friends that I differ with on the coming of the Lord. I, I got some friends that think things a little bit crazier than I do. I may differ on some things with, with people, but, but this, is, this, hey, this is the hallmark of our faith. Literally, Paul is so disturbed. Why? What, friend, I want you to listen to me. This could be the end of faith as they knew it. Do, do you get that? This could be the end of the faith. Like no more faith in Jesus Christ without adding works to it. No more faith, no, no more saved by grace through faith in that region. Can you imagine as those Jews came into, that, in, into those churches and one of the, one of the big wigs stands up and he's got some stupid looking hat on. Some big long flowing robe, probably some goofy looking beard. And he stands up and and he, and he says, boys, I, 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 guys, I, I got to tell you, what Paul was saying, man, he was right. He was right. He, man, I, you know, gee, listen, because here, here's the way this goes. Here's the way false teachers go. They're not going to come in and they're not going to say that Jesus is not the Christ. They're not going to come in and they're not going to say those words. They're not going to come in and they're, going, they're not going to blow Jesus out of the water. What they're going to do, though, is they're going to come in and they're going to say, man, now all that's good. And you need that. You need that. You need what Paul said. But you've got to have this too. He only told you part of the story and we come to fill in the rest of the blanks. Well, you got to have this. you got to be circumcised and you got to keep the law of Moses. you got to make sure that you do something else based off of what Paul said about Jesus. That's just how it works. You know, that's how, you know, that's how false prophets work. They say Jesus. They come in and they prance around and they talk about Jesus and they do a lot of Jesus stuff and Jesus says, Jesus will save you this, Jesus will save you that. And then the very next thing you know, well, you got to do this too. Well, you got to do this too. I want to show you something that's going to be rather disturbing here in just a few minutes. 
But Paul gets in passion. Paul gets emboldened. And Paul's not playing nice anymore. Paul's not, Paul's not being all sweet. Paul's not being all kind. Paul's not being all loving. No, Paul is so disturbed and he's so ticked off about the situation. He's so impassioned that, that he literally says, There is not another gospel. There's not another one. And he starts calling out the sin of the Judaizers. Don't you notice uh, there's, there's three things that I want you to recognize about this gospel. Number one, the condition of this gospel. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He's blown away that they're so soon removed from this gospel. But not only that, he's really disturbed that they would be moved away from the gospel of the grace of Christ. Now get this, the grace of Christ or the grace of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Now, you see, not, not only have they left the gospel of grace, but now get this, they're now messing around with the deity of Christ. You see, there's religions all over this world and there's many in our very own town that believe Jesus is good, they believe he's great, they believe he's needed, they believe he's a prophet, he's a good dude, he's a great man, but he's just not God's son. Do you get, the, do you get this? I, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away that you're moved from the grace of... He doesn't say Jesus, he says Christ, the Christ, the Deliverer, the Messiah, God's Son. I'm blown away that you're moved away from what you said. You, you said you believed that this was God's only begotten Son. And, and now, you're, now, now you've left it. Now you're abandoning it. Can you be a Christian if you don't believe Jesus was God's son? That's a big question, right? It's a big question. I believe you could go to most, I say most, maybe not. Maybe there's churches all around this county, probably some of the smaller ones. And you could go ask the congregation, the majority of the congregations in these churches, can you be a Christian if you don't believe Jesus is God's son? And you know what they're going to say? They're going to say no. But I, I, would, I would dare say that there's a lot. There's a lot of people pleasing. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of maybe places that are trying to keep people long enough to get them to believe that Jesus is God's son. Maybe that's what they're doing. Maybe they're maybe <clears throat> maybe they maybe they've used means to get people there, to to keep them there long enough to get them to convince them to believe that Jesus is God's son. But but I want to ask you, can can you be a Christian if you don't believe Jesus was God's son? The answer is absolutely positively no. Very first thing you can do in order to understand the gospel is to believe that Jesus was God's son. And the attack on Jesus' deity is the biggest thing that you and I are going to face in the future. The, the attack on was this man named Jesus Christ really God's son? You see, if you answer... If you answer, yeah, I think you could be a Christian, well, you're no different than a Mormon. You're no different than a, than a Latter-day Saint. You're no different than a Jehovah's Witness. You're no different than any of those false religions if you have not come to a place that you have understood that Jesus Christ was God's sinless Son made in the likeness of man who gave himself for our sin. And that don't do nothing for you guys, I guess. 
Let's talk about the attack on, the, on this gospel. The attack on this gospel, which, verse number 7, which is not another, but there, some be that tr- there, there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. They came in, they perverted the gospel, but how did they do it? That's the big thing. How did they do it? The Bible says that they did it by troubling some of them. They did it by troubling them. They did it by coming and agreeing with what Paul said in premise and theory. But really, when it all goes back to making sure, what it all goes back to is making sure that they do all that they can to help God out. To make sure that they help God and, 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 and not just help God out, but make sure that they help God themselves to get into heaven. It's crazy. It's crazy that when we come to Jesus, that we come to Jesus and we're we're so bankrupt, we're so deplorable, we're such wretched sinners when we come to Jesus. That we, we, we absolutely can do nothing to earn our salvation. But then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we're so good that we must do something now to earn it. Must do something to keep it. We got to do something to keep it, preacher. You, you, you got to do something. You, you, you want to in the flesh feel so good about the fact that you are keeping it. Flesh likes religion. The flesh likes to show a good works. I pulled this off a site. One of the one of the the, the I guess the biggest religious group of people in the world or in America. We'll say in America. I get probably the world, but we'll just use this for in America. Underneath the title of Christianity, they have they have taken they have taken some lingo, if you would, and made it their own, and tried to apply it in order to help God out in terms of keeping their salvation. There's a group that has seven sacraments. A lot of these churches you can find around Paulding County. The traditional definition, I think it's in your outline, the traditional definition of a sacrament is this. A sacrament is a visible sign instituted by Christ to give grace. Within this definition, there are three important statements. Number one, a visible sign. An action action is performed. Now, this is not in there, but it's on the screen. An action performed by a minister, usually a priest. For example, when a baby is baptized in the church, the priest pours water over its head and at the same time says the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This is a visible sign. Instituted by Christ. Lord Jesus Christ instructed his his church to offer the seven sacraments to, to his followers. Did he? I missed that one. For example, his directive to his disciples in Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, 28, 19, go tell, that's not our verse, but in there sacraments I guess they pulled sacraments out of there to give grace third statement to give grace God is grace is God's free gift of himself as the controlling influence in our life and the decisions we make once we have committed ourselves to him in faith now that sounds pretty good right don't that sound pretty that sounds pretty spiritual that sounds okay 
In, 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 but here it is. In summary, a sacrament is one of the means God has chosen to influence our life in the direction of His purpose for, uh, for giving us life. The seven sacraments are baptism, reconciliation, Eucharist, confirmation, matrimony, anointing the sick, and holy orders. Those are the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. Now, I, 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 want, I want you to look. I want you to look at something that I, I, as I'm looking up these sacraments, I just thought, man, we probably need to hit a couple of them just so you can see them. Go to the next slide, Brother Charlie. Baptism marks the entry. You, you may say, I, let, me, let me say this. You may say there's no need for us to examine other tenets of other faiths. And you're going to put us all up under one big hunky-dory title. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. Before you put me under one title with a whole group of people, I'll go back to 1963 Brushy Mountain Road and I'll raise my five kids and love my wife and get me a job that pays better than this one does. But I'm not going under the guise of any other religion with the same, and tying my name to it. You say, how serious is it? There's a whole group of people and if they really believe this, they are going to die and bust hell wide open. By the droves. And guess what? Their grandmas did, their great grandmas did, their great great grandmas did. If they believe this. You say, why are you so upset about this? I'm upset about it because I'm tired of being lumped in with a group of people that is preaching another gospel. And thinking that I'm the same. Well, really, you sure are a, a mean preacher. Yeah, probably so. Baptism marks the entry. Check it out. Baptism marks the entry of the believer into the Christian community. Along with confirmation, along, let's make sure we don't, we don't miss the words, along with confirmation and, and Eucharist, it is one of the sacraments of initiation, of initiation giving access to the full sacramental life of the church. All right, go, go to the next slide, Brother Charlie. Through baptism, we are freed from sin and joined with Christ. Now, are we talking about water baptism? Or are we talking about being baptized into Jesus Christ? I'm going to say we're talking about water baptism at this point because we're fixing to get to somebody pouring water over our head and we just got done with baby baptism, which is as fake as the day is long. But, needless, we'll go on. Sharing in his divinity and destined for eternal life, baptism leaves us permanently changed. Really? No longer the person we once were, but a new person. Dying the death, dying to death in sin, and rising to new life in Christ. Now, now, now here, here it is. Are we talking? Are we? Somebody help me. I, I'm for real. Are we talking about baptism? Are we talking about coming to faith in Christ? Because this sounds really good. If I'm being baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, not into water. Not into a dude with a funny looking robe on pouring water over my head like I'm taking a bath. Amen? Amen. Is everybody tracking with me or not? I mean, you, you say, well, you, maybe, maybe you're saying I'm, too, I'm, I'm running a close line here or something. I don't know. Uh, go to the next one, Brother Charlie. In other words, in, uh, excuse me, in the words of uh, the Apostle Paul, he, here it is. Let's make sure we take the Bible and we apply it to water baptism. We are buried with him through baptism into death in, in the order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so too, we, so too may we live a new life. Romans 6, 4. Baptism. One of the sacraments is baptism. 
Can somebody tell me we're talking about water baptism or, or, or being spiritually baptized into Christ? What are they talking about? Does anybody know? Water baptism. The right. <laughs> the right consists of what right? The right we just got done talking about, which makes me a brand new person, evidently. The right consists of pouring water over the head while saying the Trinitarian formula. You know what's scary? We'll get in bed with them jokers. We'll get in bed with them mugs. For the sake of the gospel. That's what, you say, brother, y'all are so, y'all are so narrow-minded, y'all are so secluded, y'all, you know why? Because this garbage right here. That's why. Because some dude decided that he was going to take the Bible and butcher it, and he's going to tie, he, he's going to make being baptized in Christ, he's going to, he's going to turn it into to having water poured over our heads. God help the entire world to believe such garbage as this. You say, what, what, what brother Lee, you, you, you are awful. You, you're, you're running a close line here. I may be, but I'm going to tell you something. There's a world out there preaching. This is another gospel. This is another gospel. This is not real. This is fake. This is false. This is Get out of the way. The train is going to run you over. What, what about the Eucharist? Eucharist is, a sacrament, uh, is, is the sacrament in which we receive the body. and the, Now this is the best one right here. Where we receive the body and the blood of Christ. The church teaches. Th this, is not, this is not our church. BTW. That Christ is really present in the bread and the wine that ye have that have been consecrated by the priest at Mass. Although the bread and wine, here it is, you ready? Man, this is a magic trick in and of itself. Although the bread and the wine, they still look and taste like bread and wine. I, I'm talking about magic show fixing to happen right here. The substance. You ready? What is actually there, somewhere in the esophageal reason, region, it changes. It's been changed. It turns into flesh of Jesus, and it turns into blood of Jesus. And if anybody wants to know, this is the greatest thing Francis Chan ever heard, evidently. You knew it was coming, Brother Dan. This is Francis Chan's... This is the light at the end of the tunnel for none other than, than, than Francis Chan. And the, once, the, the guy that, that, that sold everything he owned, that, that was pastor in a church in America, sold everything he owned, moved to a foreign country because God, it's, it's just what you do lived below poverty level. Now he has come back and, and listen, he's got a brand new enlightenment about him and it just so happens that the Eucharist is one of the greatest things that he's ever been a part of. What, what is that, Brother Lee? It's another gospel. It's a completely different gospel. We, I gotta hurry. Let me give you this last one. This, this is a good one too. Jordan, she got in on this one. Confirmation. Before Jesus was put to death, he promised his followers that he would send his spirit to comfort and to strengthen them. True to his promise, the Holy Spirit was poured out on them on Pentecost, 40 days after his resurrection from the dead. The sacrament of confirmation is our own Pentecost. When we are confirmed, we receive the Holy Spirit. When we're confirmed now, we receive the Holy Spirit. And, and here it is. Here's how we receive it. Through the anointing of oil and the laying on of hands by the bishop or a priest anointing, an, appointed by him 
when we receive this sacred seal, here it is, to show, we show we belong to God. Why are you saying all that? Why are you why 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 are you why, why are you saying all that? Well, because I think we're so naive, we don't believe that there even is another gospel out there. We believe they're all the same. We believe, oh, that, you know, I can't say nothing about this. I can't say nothing about that. I can't, I can't go and preach that. that you know why evangelism is so important in this day? Because nobody believes, knows what the heck they believe anyway. Let me give you one more and I'll, I'll roll it up. There's a group out there called the Protestant Church. They broke off from, they, they one day, I don't know how, one day they picked up a Bible and they started reading Romans and Galatians and, and, and a guy got a holy burn within him and said, no, this ain't right, boys. And they departed from the Catholic Church. They realized they'd been teaching heresy, but that they're, they still had a little bit in them of what they came out of. So they broke off. As they broke off, they somehow or another, they adopt this, this whole deal that would put something on man to ensure his salvation is secure. And they, they have a point. They have a, a, a designated slot for it. And it's called enduring to the end. That a man is actually only, his only real way to secure his salvation is to make sure that he endures all the way to the end. If you endure to the end, you're in the family of God. If you endure to the end, hey, you know what? You, you, you must be the real deal. And we got to make sure that we do everything we can to make sure that you endure to the end because then you prove that you are in fact in the family of God. Now why is that so wrong? Well, because Ephesians 2 is in the Bible. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any stinking man should boast. Being justified, Romans 3, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, not in the enduring of your own faith. Titus 3 and verse number 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, hath he, uh, according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Romans 4 and verse 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. And let me give you this last one, and, and, and I promise, uh, Daniel, you can come on whenever you get ready. Lastly is the severity of the gospel, of this gospel. The severity of this gospel. But though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that that you have received, let him be accursed. If, any, if he comes and he preaches anything other than this gospel, let him be accursed. This word accursed means damned. Let him be damned. Where is he going to be damned to, Brother Lee? Well, the only place you probably figure he's going to be damned to. Let him be damned to hell for preaching any other gospel. That's how serious this is. And everybody that we named, everybody that we talked about, how about this? This group of people that says, oh, you got to be baptized in order to go to heaven. He said, if he preaches any other gospel, let him be damned. Let him be accursed. You say, brother, I got news for you. All that stuff you're saying... It doesn't look very Christian. It doesn't look very spiritual. I'll be honest with you, man. I've been to bookstores and I've seen what spiritual and Christian looks like these days. Whether you believe it or not, 
Joel Osteen spiritual. Joel Osteen's Christian. You ever got a hold of any of his stuff? Just stumbled up on it. You and I, you know, is what it is. I'm not. I'm not real interested. That in I'm, I'm, I'll be 40 this year. And as I get closer to the rapture, I get closer to the ending of my life. My kids are getting older. And I see, I see what I've got to be for my children. I don't really care anymore what spiritual and Christian looks like. I, I want to know, I want to know what does biblical look like? What, is, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible have to say? What, why, why is this such a big deal? I want you to notice the consequences. Real quick, I want you to notice the consequences. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man died also and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may, Lazarus, that he may dip his the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And he, but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus his evil, thing, evil things. But now is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, now I want you to get this right here, besides all this, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence, hence too you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore. Here's how bad this was. Father, that thou wouldest also come. Uh, I pray thee therefore that thou wouldest send, to my, send him to my father's house. You ready? For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest also lest also come into this place of torment. Notice what Abraham says. He says, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. They have Moses and the prophets. Let, let them hear them. Let them hear the word of God. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went... If one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise, will one rose from the dead. Get, get it and get it good. Get it and get it good, man. God is, God is very adamant that biblical, biblical is better then supernatural miracles happening right before lost people's eyes. Are, are you hearing me? God is saying, even if I let one rise from the very grave out of the ground and they laid their eyes on them, lost, if they won't hear Moses and the prophets, there's no sense in me sending one back from the dead. Friend, you know there's a whole world out there looking for something. God, do some miracle. And I'll believe you. God, do this. God, do that. You see, the consequences are this, that people are going to die and they're going to end up in the same place the rich man ended up because somebody wouldn't bear down and study to show themselves approved and preach the stinking whole counsel of God. Revelation 20 and verse 11, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. There was found no place for them, and I saw the dead great, excuse me, small and great stand before God, and the books were open. Another book was opened, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book of life, in the books according to their works, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell were delivered up from, from the dead, up of the dead, and uh, which were were in them 
and they were judged every man according to their works. Get this, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever's and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The biggest threat, the biggest consequence, excuse me, the biggest consequence that ever that 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 ever will be faced. That false prophets propagating another gospel. It's going to be a whole group of people. And they're going to step out. They're going to step out into eternity having believed that this baptismal ceremony, this baptismal rite actually got them into the kingdom of God. having believed that they got to participate in all seven sacraments, having believed that they have to go through a a, a class, a confirmation class to confirm them and for them to finally receive the Holy Ghost and to seal them. They're going to die and they're going to bust hell wide open. The threat here is this. One day there's going to be a guy. He's going to step out on the scene. He's going to do some miracles. There's going to be a whole group of people following right off into a devil's hell. Why? Because they've been believing a lie for a long time. It's not going to be hard to convince them of that lie. Ain't it crazy that you got the truth? You got the truth. We we ain't done nothing but preach the Bible. We haven't had, I haven't added anything to you. I just preach the Bible. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You know what's wrong with the modern day church? You know what's wrong with 2021's church? I get it. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I got this personality that, that I don't necessarily always like. I get it. Not everybody's built like me. But you know what the, you know what the church's biggest problem is? They're weak. They're stinking weak. Stinking weak, man. Won't call it for what it is. Scared to call it for what it is. Got a backbone like a Raymond noodle. Won't call it for what it is. I, I can't help but think about David's brothers. David's brothers, David comes down, he hears about. He hears about the Philistine defying the armies of the living God. What does he do? He comes down. First thing his brothers say, what, what, hey, what, where, where is those few sheep that you had? Where, where's those, where's those, what, why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep? What, 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 what are you doing down here? And, and David makes the statement. What have I done? What have I now done? And he, and he says, is there not a cause? Friend, i got to ask you. While we're standing around quivering in our shoes, is there not a cause to stand up and preach the real gospel? You say, well, I, I don't know, about, know anybody that's in a fake one. You, you probably don't know many that's in a real one. That's just the truth of the matter. Well, everybody I know, I know we're in the South. We're in the Bible Belt. We're in the Bible Belt. We need to take the belt off and beat the South to death with it. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Are we going to stand? Are we going to let false prophets come in? into this church 
I don't think we ever would in this church, but you know what? That doesn't mean they're not going to try. I don't think that there's I don't think there's a group of people in here that would adhere and get on board with false prophets. But let me tell you, that don't mean they ain't going to try. That don't mean they are not going to rock the boat. That doesn't mean that they're not going to come in as grievous wolves and try to try to tear the flock of God apart. Now you've got to you've got to make the decision though. Is there a cost? You got friends that are going to die and go to hell in their own man-made religion. You got friends, you got people you know, and man, if something don't happen, God don't change their life. God don't get in the midst of everything that they got going on. Listen, they're going to die and they're going to suffer a Christless eternity. It's not bad because there's flames. It's bad because Jesus ain't there. It's bad because there's no deliverer. It's bad because there's no Messiah. It's not bad because there's a worm there and it dieth not. It's bad because there's no Messiah. There's no deliverer. It's not bad because it's dark. It's not bad because there's weeping. It's not bad because there's people gnashing on on people in hell with their teeth. It's not bad because of all that. It's bad because there's nobody to deliver them from the weeping and the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. It's bad because there's nobody to deliver them from the darkness. It's bad because there's nobody to deliver them from the fire. There is no God. There is no love. There's only evil. There's only hate. There's only the despising of man. It's bad because there is no Christ. There is no gospel. We got to decide. We got to decide. Now I will say the rest of this book is not so much geared towards a false gospel as much as it is from, from those entranced in religious activity. But this morning, you got to decide who you're going to be. You got to decide who you're going to be. You're going you're gonna to keep playing with sin? You're going to let your friends jump off into hell while you play with sin? You're going you're gonna to keep playing the role and you're going to keep coming to church? You're going to keep being a good church kid? Kids in this room, teenagers in this, you're going to keep being good church kids? Or are you going to decide, I'm not, I'm not just going to be a church kid? I'm going to be a soul winner. Let's do this. Every head bowed. I wonder if there's somebody in here and you say, man, Brother Lee, I I need you to pray for me. I want you to pray for me. I got some things in my life. Maybe maybe you need to come. If you want to come, you can come on. But maybe maybe there's some things in your life and you say, Brother Lee, if if I'm honest, there's people in my life that have bought in and, and it's just religion. They bought into religion. They bought into good works. They bought into things that make them feel good about themselves. And it has nothing to do with the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ. You say, man, I I want you to pray for me that I'd be emboldened enough to witness to them this week. Would you slide your hand up right there? I see them. I see them. Yeah. Amen. I wonder if there's somebody in here and you say, Brother Lee, don't you pray for me? I'm not real sure about my own salvation. I wish you'd pray for me this morning. Would you just slide your hand up? Say, I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not real sure about my own salvation. All right, I see that one. I see that one. I see that one. You say, Brother Lee, I'm not real sure about my own salvation and where it rests. I want you to pray for me. There's two, there's two that made acknowledgement. There, there's another. You say, Brother Lee, pray for me. I wonder, I, I wonder how many Christians, and listen, if you can't have a burden for lost people enough to say, you know what, I, I, want, I want to get serious about my burden for lost people. If you, can't have, if you can't have that burden and get serious about it, then I wonder where you stand. I wonder how carnal your life really is. I wonder how self-absorbed and self-consumed you really are with life. I wonder how many of you, you say, Brother Lee, I, th- this, this is for you in this room. You, you know where your salvation is. You got lost people in your life. They are consumed with another gospel. They have believed in religion for far too long. And it, hey, listen, you can be a good Baptist and lost.
raised in this thing, know all the lingo, know all how to say it, and never have come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, you don't have to leave this room lost. You don't have to leave this place lost. You don't have to leave not knowing the gospel of grace. The grace of God. You're in here and say, Brother Lee, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm going to come find me a place in this altar. I'm saved. I know that I am. I'm going to come find me a place in this altar. And I'm, I'm, I, I need, I got some, some specifics that I need to pray about this morning. And, and, and I want you to come. You come right now. You get out of your seat. You find you a place here in this altar. Say, Look, preacher, I'm coming because I got some things in my own life, some people in my own life, but I want to come and I want to make a public declaration. Look, I, I'm, I'm here making this declaration. I wonder, maybe you're in here, and you're a Christian, you say, I ain't got no reason to really come pray. I wonder how many of you come pray for the lost people that are in this room right now. You get out of your seat, you find your place here in this altar, you, you want to pray for lost people in this room that publicly acknowledge they're lost. They're unsure about their own salvation. You're in here, I, I, every head bowed, you just keep them that way. You say, Brother Lee, I raised my hand a while ago and I said, I, 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 I don't have any assurance of my own salvation. I don't even know where my own salvation rests. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to listen. Listen really good. Would you get out of your seat right where you are? If you meant what you said when you raised your hand, and, and, and two of you raised it twice, you meant what you said, would you get out of your seat and meet me here at this front altar, at this front pew, and I'm going to take a Bible. Me or another, another person, another lady in this room, would take a Bible and show you what it means to be saved. If you meant that, you meant business with God, right now, would you stand up right out of your seat? You stand up right out of your seat, right where you are. You raise your hand and say, Brother Lee, I don't, know. I don't have any assurance in my own self. Would you stand up right where you are? Meet me here in this altar. And let, let, me, let me or somebody else take a Bible and show you what it means. All right? You meant that, you meant that a while ago. Here's what I want you to do. You say, Brother Lee, I, I meant it. I meant what I, when I raised my hand, I said, I had no assurance. You, you meant that. Raise your hand again. Raise your hand again. Just let me see it, all right? I see that one. Raise your hand again. Keep it up there long enough for me to see it. Now, I want you to do one more thing. I want you to look at me. Look at me. Look, just keep looking at me. There ain't no, there ain't no better day than you to do what you need to do today. Whatever you got going on, whatever it is in life, whatever's keeping you where you're at, abandon that, abandon all that junk, and right now make the deciding decision that I'm not going to keep doing what I've been doing. This is your day. You got that opportunity. People in this altar is praying for you. People in this altar is praying for you. Brother Daniel's going to sing. When he sings, there's they, they, they three of you in this room. By your own admission, there's three of you in this room. By your own admission, if you die right now, you have no assurance of your own salvation. I'm begging you, as Brother Daniel sings, I'm begging you to get out of your seat right where you are. There's no other gospel but this one that will save you. Get out of your seat right where you are. Me or somebody else will take a Bible and show you what it means to have complete assurance in your own faith, in your own salvation. Go ahead, Brother Daniel. See the Lord 
voice of love that's calling. There's a cheer waiting for you. Come on. And there's a friend who understands everything you're going through. You keep standing at a distance in the shadow of your shame. See the light of hope that's shining. Won't you come and take your place? Man, I wish you'd come. And bring it all to the table. nothing he ain't seen before wrong your sin and your sorrow and your burdens there's a savior and he calls bring it all yeah, to the table well, he can't see the weight you carry And the fears it hold your heart and Through the cross you've been forgiven You're accepted as you are So bring it all to the table There's nothing he ain't seen for all your sin and your sorrow and your burdens, there's a Savior and He calls. Bring it all to the table. But we're we're gonna go one more verse. You come or you don't come, whatever it is. Uh, well, here's here's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna sing "Amazing Grace." One verse. You want to come? There's some of you in here, and and you may need to come for various reasons. But I I am I am begging you. If you got something you need to do with the Lord this morning, God God is working. And God is moving and God in your own heart, in my heart, in other hearts in this room. Man, I, I just wouldn't gamble. I just wouldn't, I wouldn't chance it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mess, I wouldn't mess with God right now. One more shot. One more verse. Shane, won't you pray for us?